Over the centuries, Ulster Scots folk have garnered a reputation for piety and politics with strongly held beliefs and great traditions. But what we're less well known for is our culture of storytelling and love of a good yarn, often passed down through the generations. Many of these stories were told to pass a dark night around the fireside, tales kept for when the wains had gone to bed. I'm Darren Gibson, writer and Ulster Scot, and there's nothing I like more than a yarn about ghosts. And I'm David Hume, author and Ulster Scots historian. I'm equally fascinated by these stories. David and I share an obsession in trying to find the truth behind these folk tales. What can these families tell us about the story of the White Lady? From historic castles. There's a legend about this picture, isn't there? There is indeed, yeah. To dark cellars. Well, he believed that there was tunnels, actually, that ran onto the house. Lonely roads. This road is supposed to be the most haunted road in Northern Ireland. And abandoned graveyards. And that was the dare to come in here at Halloween at midnight and to stand in here for one minute inside this uh, enclosure. Come along with us as we try to uncover the truth behind the stories told to make a body a feared. It's lonesome at the doors the night, but cosy here a thin. Blow up the turfs and mack a blaze. Ah, thon's a darling gin. And now I'm going to tell ye what you'll say's a win a lease. It's a true, as thon's the win a thut that's whistling run the trees. As the stories would have it, this 18th century rectory in Donegal's Lagan Valley is said to be home to two ghostly figures who are said to have walked the corridors here for over 200 years. We were in bed at night and we would hear the footsteps coming up the back staircase. It was just one night I could hear the rattle of the trunk at the bottom of the bed. This ghost story originates from a key flashpoint in Irish history, and the truth behind it is a gruesome tale of murder and rebellion that led to uprising and insurrection. In 1797, Sharon Rectory was home to the esteemed Anglican minister John Waller and his wife Sarah. On the evening of March the 2nd, the couple were joined by William Hamilton, also an Anglican minister from nearby Fanad Parish. Hamilton had reportedly missed his ferry home and diverted to his friends, the Wallers, for supper. The Anglican church was the established church in 18th century Ireland, but represented only a minority. In areas like the Lagan Valley, harsh penal laws treated Catholics and Presbyterians alike as second-class citizens, restricting everything from property ownership to holding public office and practicing their religion. It was in this context that stirrings of insurrection became evident in the form of a rebellious organization under the name of the United Irishmen. Reverend Hamilton was also a magistrate for the Crown and had started to crack down severely on anyone suspected of being a member. Hamilton, John and Sarah Waller were having supper when the house was surrounded by an angry crowd. They were United Irish men. They'd come here with murder in mind and they were after William Hamilton. These United Irish men were a mix of ordinary churchgoers, Presbyterians, Catholics, farmers and labourers, all driven to take action. By the end of the night, Sarah Waller and William Hamilton lay dead. Mm -hmm. 
Hamilton had a fearsome reputation. His enforcement of the harsh penal laws of the time made him deeply unpopular, and his penchant for public hangings earned him the moniker Bloody Hamilton. David, what could have drove these ordinary people to rebel in such a way? Well, there would have been a number of factors, Darren. A big factor, really, was the penal laws. Now, the penal laws usually are seen as having much more impact on the Catholic population, but they also impact on all nonconformists, so the Presbyterians were involved in the sweep of that. In this area, particularly, one thing that caused a great deal of resentment was the Test Act, which was part of the penal laws. It meant that if, if you didn't take the sacrament in the established church, you couldn't hold public office, for example. So in the context of this area, in Londonderry, half of the city corporation was thrown out of office because they were Presbyterian. Now, they regarded themselves as having saved the city during the siege, and they saw this as very poor reward. So it caused a lot of resentment uh, and bitterness. Another element was that there was a rising Presbyterian middle class. They were becoming quite affluent. Uh, but while they had this economic affluence, they had no actual say in the body politic and in society, if you like. So those factors led to this uh, idea of pushing for constitutional reform. And that had started back in the, certainly in the 1770s with the Irish volunteer movement and continued on right down into the United Irish Society then, 1791. Well, the United Irish Society was formed in Belfast and it was largely the influence of, of Belfast Presbyterians. And the, the object was famously uh, put forward by Wolf Tone. It was the, the, the idea of um, uniting Protestant, which means Church of Ireland, Catholic, which is Roman Catholic, and Dissenter, which is Presbyterian, in the common name of Irishman. So that's what that term means in the context of the 18th century. There was a coalition, but it was an uneasy coalition between Catholics and Presbyterians in relation to that, because there were different uh, ideas about what this all, was all about, effectively, too. Initially, it was constitutional reform. The authorities uh, balked at this idea of, of this mass movement effectively demanding reforms, so they made them illegal. And from 1795 onwards, they were underground, um, and the issue of reform was more, more or less coalescing into the idea of effectively rebellion and, and revolution. So the authorities believed this would lead to upending of society. It would, it would just lead to general disorder and revolution. Uh, and they wanted to make sure they, they were in control. By the time of the murders here at Sharon, the United Irish Men were a large underground movement with a considerable foothold here in the Lagan Valley. It has always been reported that Hamilton missed a ferry crossing, and that's how he ended up having supper at the rectory with his friends the Wallers but that might not necessarily be the case. So, Darren, this is a copy of the Donegal Annual about the actual incident here about the Sharon murders. It's very detailed because it's come down from a lady called uh, Sarah Leach, who was born in 1791. It tells us then that um, the occasion of the, the murders, Hamilton had been, um, supposedly had been on his way to Derry. He was interested in getting more uh, military into this right. area. He was concerned about the United Irish men in the area. Up until now, David, have we not been told that he was on his way home? Mm -hmm. Yes, there's varying accounts, and that's always <laughs> the difficulty with oral history. If Hamilton was in the area to discuss bringing in the military, then it might explain why the United Irishmen took their chance to strike first. This bloody event in Donegal was one of the sparks that would light the touch paper of revolution just a year later. This was a rebellion of 1798, known to Ulster Scots as the Turnit. The events of this time are engraved deep in the history of the Ulster Scots people. W.G. Little, in his masterful work, Betsy Gray and the Hearts of Down, reflects on this period the soldiers are coming. Run fast, run fast. We guns and we bayonets, run fast, run fast. They're looking for guns and they're looking for pikes. They'll show you nay mercy, the bloodthirsty takes.
The story of what happened here in Sharon Rectory that fateful night in 1797 has been handed down through the generations. Current resident of the rectory, Emma Louise Tully, has lived with this story for most of her life. So Emma, in this room, we had Sarah and John Waller and Hamilton had joined them for supper. And then what happened? So the crowd gathered outside of the United Irishmen. And they were in here, they were having a conversation and the upheaval happened outside. They were shouting for Hamilton and they started to shoot through the windows. Hamilton ran and Lady Waller, she stood in front of her husband and she got shot in the shoulder and then she got shot in the ear. I can get a real sense of actual danger, you know, as we're looking out there. We could be standing here and, and that group of United Irishmen with the muskets outside, I mean, it brings it all to life, actually looking at where this happened just yes. over 200 years ago. Yes, it's, it's crazy. It's, I just couldn't imagine the fear that night. So let me get this right. The shots come through the window and Hamilton, he gets out of here quick. Mm -hmm. So he, he makes his exit. Yeah, and then what happens to Sarah? So Sarah falls to the ground and she manages to crawl to this reception hallway. Let's see. So Sarah finally crawled as far as here and then the servants got her, isn't that right? Yes, the servants came up and they dragged her down to the servants' quarters um, where she later passed away. So a real horrific scene. I can imagine Sarah lying here bleeding from these horrific wounds. Meanwhile, Hamilton, he'd made his escape. He'd, he'd done a runner into the cellar, isn't he that right? He fled into the cellar. Um, by all means, you can go down. You can go first because I'm quite scared of the cellar. Oh, thank you. These shocking murders didn't go unnoticed. They made the national press. And given the tumultuous times, there were, of course, conflicting reports. So, Darren, we have two newspaper accounts here from the time. The first one is a report of uh, a speech in the Irish House of Commons by Dr Brown. Uh, appears in the Belfast newsletter uh, for the 10th of March, 1797. And it says here that uh, Dr. Brown related to the House the melancholy circumstances of Mr. Hamilton's murder in a northern county. And he said that they murdered Hamilton in a most inhuman and barbarous manner, intending, as they thought, to make this active and able magistrate an example to others. So very clearly the sense that uh, he was made an example to make others scared to actually take action against the United Irish men. And then you have the Northern Star, which of course was the United Irish newspaper uh, of the time, and it refers in a different way, a subtly different way, I think, probably to the whole thing. It talks about the murder of the unfortunate Dr. Hamilton and Mrs. Waller. Uh, it, it accuses um, others in, in terms of uh, journals of uh, what it says as venting their atrocious malice against the United Irishmen. The language used here by the Northern Star is very defensive, and it's by no means an omission of guilt of any kind. And the other thing I think that strikes me is poor Mrs. Waller and the Reverend Hamilton. I mean, they get the word unfortunate used about them. Um, so this, clearly this paper is a mouthpiece for the United Irishman. It's a really interesting uh, report. Um, the use of the word unfortunate, it's really interesting language. It, um, I mean, it would be unfortunate if you stepped off the carriage and, and tripped, that would be <laughs> unfortunate. But to use the word unfortunate in the context of really a very barbarous uh, murder and it's really, really interesting. Violent events like those at Sharon Rectory would become all too familiar in the months that followed, leading up to the rebellion of the United Irishmen in 1798, a period of history that has lived long in the memory as many ghost stories and folk tales reveal. One such tale involves the hanging of United Irishmen in Ballymoney's town square. So David, what do we know about the role of the United Irishmen here in Ballymoney at the time? Well, very similar to the role in other sort of heartlands of the, the Ulster Scots and the Presbyterians. They would have been very much involved with the radicalism of uh, the Enlightenment and the Presbyterian uh, ideas of the time. They would have been playing quite a pivotal part once the writing occurred here in June. Uh, and we know that uh, this whole area was, was a centre of insurgency. It was uh, 
quite a significant rural and quite a significant geographical location, of course, too, in terms of County Antrim here. A local soap maker, Alexander Gamble, an Ulster Scot, was one of the leaders of this failed rebellion. He was offered a, a deal at the time uh, that if he provided the names of those that had taken part in the rebellion, then his life would be saved. Uh, and, and famously, uh, he didn't do that. Uh, so he was executed here. But perhaps surprisingly, the folklore doesn't speak of Gamble's ghost. Much like the stories of Sharon Rectory, the ghostly figure in this tale comes in the form of a magistrate. Just like Lagan Valley had Bloody Hamilton, Balamoney has its own version of the hanging judge in Bloody Hutchinson. George Hutchinson was said to have relished sending men, particularly United Irishmen like Alexander Gamble, to the gallows. We're standing here where it all happened. What would have been over here? Obviously, the gallows would have been here. There would have been some soldiers, I imagine, gathered around. I mean, what, sort of paint a picture for me. What, what, would have, what would have looked like, do you think? Uh, the town itself would have been badly damaged by fire because a lot of houses had been burnt as a retaliation when, when the, the military came in. And uh, you'd have had a very sombre, tense uh, situation here, I think. Such was the enormity of these events that stories have endured right up until the present day. Bloody Hutchinson's ghostly figure is said to still appear on this street, walking up and down in the dead of night, on the very spot where his victims hung. This was a desperately important event. It sort of brought, I think, a bit of a closure to the whole episode of the 1798 Rising in this area. Well, I guess what you're kind of saying is the Gambles almost personifies the cause here of the United Irishman. I mean, there's a brilliant sort of thramness where he's holding on to uh, the honour and he's not going to betray his friends. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a fantastic sort of element to, to the story. Uh, I suppose when you look at it in this way, there are a lot of um, graves that are not identified in Balamone as United Irish graves because Alexander Gamble held his, his peace and didn't give up those names. Alexander Gamble's remains were discovered in 1883 and reinterred in the nearby cemetery. His grave lies close to where George Hutchinson, the man who sentenced him to hang, is buried. So here we are at Hutchinson's grave. Yeah, this is it. This is the, the plot. Do you know what? Nature's taken over. Uh, you've got all the ivy growing here. You've you've trees coming in here as well too. The state of neglect. Yeah. We can see why there's this local legend, uh, this almost rite of passage, where on a certain Halloween night, I think they're they're dared to come here and stand for a certain length of time. Isn't that right? Yes. That was the dare to come in here at Halloween at midnight and to stand in here for one minute inside this uh, enclosure and touch the stone. Uh, Hutchinson Stone. Um, so that that would have that would have been quite a scary thing, I think, I think for me. I, I, don't, think, I don't, don't think you'd have found me in here at Halloween night for one minute or or for one second, probably <laughs> inside this cemetery on Halloween. Alexander Gamble's sense of loyalty to his fellow United Irishmen sealed his fate. But this was a movement driven by a sense of extreme injustice at the way they were treated by the Anglican establishment. It was this anger and resentment that brought a baying crowd to the doors of Sharon Rectory that March night in 1797, intent on getting their hands on that other hated magistrate, William Hamilton. The United Irishmen had surrounded Sharon Rectory. They'd threatened to burn this house. They had shot into it and killed Sarah Waller, and they were adamant that they wanted Dr. Hamilton thrown out here to them. So in fear of his life, Hamilton rushed down these steps and fled into the cellar here. Yeah, he believed that there was tunnels actually that ran onto the house. So he'd hoped to, to get an escape. He was looking for an escape He was route. looking for an oh, escape okay. route. He knew it was his end. Um, you can just imagine the fear that night that would have been just the energy and you know, just Absolutely. the atmosphere of what had happened. With the crowd growing impatient and threatening to set fire to the house, it seems those inside took matters into their own hands. Barney McCafferty, a servant of the Wallers, dragged Hamilton out of the cellar. 
And when he gets to the end of the hallway, of course, he grabs this banister, doesn't he? Yeah, he grabs the banister and there was actually fire on in the living room and one of the men actually got a hot poker and held it to the fire to heat it and then they held it to his hands until he let go. Burn his hand they off the banister. They burned his hands off the banister. And then out of the door and into the house. He was dragged then into the United Irishman. Into the United Irishman. David, this death was a very gruesome death. This this was a yeah. brutal murder. I mean, he yeah. wasn't shot or stabbed or anything. He was mutilated, wasn't he? He was barely recognisable. So we can but presume that, uh, you know, he, he had been very badly uh, beaten and, and injured and wounded and so forth in the midst of all of this. Um, and it's almost as if the, the sort of uh, personification of everything that was wrong in the United Irishmen's view focused on Hamilton at that particular instant. So it was really, it was a mob rule, it was a lynch mob. So once Hamilton was put out here, and they shuttered up the house and boarded it up, isn't that right? Yes, the, the house is effectively is still under siege, certainly as far as the people inside are concerned. Um, the, the, you know, you can only imagine what it was going to be like there inside. They're, they're bound to hear everything that's happening here. You had Mrs. Waller in the house was dead, um, and you, you had then the threat that there were lots of uh, malcontent people outside. Stories of the terrible scene haunted the area for decades. But more than that, some people believe that the uneasy spirits of William Hamilton and Sarah Waller did also. Many believe they haunted still. Having lived here for decades, Emma Louise and her mother certainly have their own chilling stories to tell. Our first experiences in the house would have been with my mum and my dad and myself um, when we were in bed at night and we would hear the footsteps coming up the back staircase. I seen a figure coming in the room and forming into a lady. She then went into my parents' room. I could hear the rattle of the trunk at the bottom of the bed. I just looked up and I could see her. She just looked as if she was standing on the side, just beside the bed. It was about 10 nights in a row, every night. She was just there. And you believe that this figure is Sarah Waller? Yeah, whenever um, my mum actually done the research on the house and the history, um, they found out about the Wallers and how Sarah died. We just kind of twigged it then that she might have been this blue lady that we were seeing nightly. Whether you believe in ghosts or not, this place does have a distinctly eerie feel to it. This blue lady hasn't appeared in a number of years, but strange sounds in the dead of night persist to this day. We know murders took place and that tales of this haunted house have been handed down over two centuries. But what more do we know about the facts of the case? So we know that the United Irishmen were outside. They were shooting into the house. But I'm wondering, what about the people inside the house? I mean, were they sympathetic to the United Irishmen? Were they in on the plot? Bernard McCafferty was charged with aiding and abetting the murder. And he appears at Lifford Assizes. And the whole court case is reprinted uh, in, the, in the newspapers. And the first person to give evidence is a man called William Shields, who is the servant of Dr. Hamilton. So he says the, the first thing that alarmed the witness at night was the firing of guns while he was in the servants' hall. The prisoner, uh, McCafferty, was not there then, but he had been there all the evening and witness had seen him about a quarter of an hour before he heard the firing. It seems in the absence of anyone else to blame this upon that a lot of the focus is on poor Bernard. Obviously, there's a, a large body of men have been involved in this, but they, they don't seem to have been able to get anyone to court. Bernard McCafferty is the one person who does appear. Uh, what happens in the trial is that McCafferty is found not guilty of aiding and abetting. Possibly because um, Dr. Waller made the suggestion that uh, McCafferty was not acting in a, in a way that was uh, in, co in conjunction with the United Irishmen or in league with the United Irishmen, um, and that they were trying to preserve the lives of the other people in the house. McCafferty was found not guilty, but during my research I've discovered another name who makes for a most unlikely suspect in the case. Well, there's an intriguing report in the Belfast newsletter, and it really uh, it adds a bit of intrigue to all of this. Uh, and it says, yesterday evening, a report was very confidently circulated in town that a gentleman found on the next morning near the house of the Reverend Mr. Waller a ball cartridge made up 
in a piece of written paper, which on opening he discovered to be part of a letter directed to a person of reputable situation in life, resident in Derry, and a party of cavalry repaired to the house of this person and found upon him the counterpart of the identical letter from which the cartridge paper had been torn. He was taken immediately into custody. David, this is getting exciting now. Have we finally got a conviction? Is there someone who's responsible for this murder? Well, uh, unfortunately, this is really quite standalone, this article. Uh, but we do have a secondary account then. This is a primary account of, of, of what has happened at the time. The secondary account doesn't come until 1905 and, uh, and, and this little book uh, by a gentleman called Leckie about the Lagan uh, area. And he details here that a situation happened with the Reverend Francis Dill, who's a Presbyterian minister. And he said that uh, Reverend Francis Dill had a narrow escape for his life, having been accused to the authorities by some evil disposed person of being concerned in an armed attack made on the night of the 2nd of March, 1797. Mr. Dill was arrested and tried by court martial and was about to be sentenced to death when a member of his congregation appeared and testified that Mr. Dill was in his house visiting a member of his family who was dying at the hour that the rectory was, was attacked. So I suppose the question that comes to mind here is, could Dill have been involved in this? I mean, it was a, it was a Presbyterian. Uh, many of the United Irishmen were Presbyterian. I mean, was he involved in this murder at Sharon Rectory? Well, I suppose that is the big question, isn't it? Um, as a Presbyterian minister, he could have been sympathetic to the idea of reform or indeed the idea of the United Irishmen. But equally, he was a minister, so it's unlikely he would have, he would have countenanced this sort of attack. But unfortunately, we really don't know. But it all makes for a good story, doesn't it? Makes for a fantastic <laughs> story. Yes, it does indeed. Ultimately, no one was ever convicted for the murders of William Hamilton and Sarah Waller. But we do know that some of the locals disappeared abroad in the aftermath. No doubt United Irishmen are sympathizers. But what has been the legacy of this event and the rebellion that followed? Well, the short-term legacy was a complete crackdown by the authorities. Uh, you had insurgents being hanged, had been arrested, some of them fled. Uh, so that was the short term. The long term was the Act of Union, of course, of 1801. That was the, 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 the long term consequence of the, of the rebellion, which was not what the, the insurgents wanted at the start. Although a lot of the Presbyterians welcomed the idea that the Dublin Parliament had been swept away. And so by 1812, a majority of Ulster Scots are signing the Ulster Covenant to say they don't want Home Rule for Ireland, whereas in 1798, many of their ancestors would have been involved full circle in that. It yes, happened. full circle. Historic events like the signing of the Covenant or the battles of 1798 are documented in history books and puzzled over by historians. But there's value in memory, insights to be uncovered in stories of local events which have their part to play in understanding history. The names of Sarah Waller and William Hamilton are unlikely to ever be forgotten as long as people spin yarns of their ghostly appearances. Tales told to make a body a feared. A curlew skirls are the bogland heather. Far off there's a roar frae the drummily sea. The black trees twist in the cowl black weather and the cowl rain soaks through me. Oh, where are ye riding, 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 singing, thundering o'er my head? Will you find me still, wherever I'm hiding? Oh, ye ghosts o' the dead. <laughs> <laughs>